I appreciate you joining us for this time of Bible study, and I'm praying that our time together in God's Word will be helpful to you in your spiritual growth. And as always, I want to encourage you, uh, if you ever have any questions or comments, to contact me. You can send me an email or call the church office, and that information is found on our website, hopebiblechurchga.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, I'd like to encourage you, if you live in the area, to come out and visit us at Hope Bible Church. Uh, we're easy to find. We're located not too far from I-75 or Highway 42 in Locust Grove. Uh, directions to the church properties on the website as well as information about the church. We'd love for you to come out and visit us anytime. And also, while you're on the website, you might want to check out some of the Bible study material we have available, not only in video format, but audio. Uh, we have verse-by-verse -verse teaching through many books of the Bible. We also have written studies available for you to download and check out. And we just want to be a help to you. Uh, in your Bible study. That's why we call this Bible study time. It's all about studying the Word of God. And uh, the reason why this is so important is because the Bible is the Word of God. What's more important than knowing the truth about the Lord and what He's revealed to us in His Word? That is the most important thing. Bible study is not just about gaining knowledge. It's about the knowledge of God and His plan and purpose for the ages, to know Him and to know His will, and to have a right relationship with Him. The most important thing is to know that you're saved. That's the first key to Bible study because if you're not saved, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. And if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you'll never really be able to see the spiritual truth of God's Word. The Bible is a spiritual book given by inspiration of God. 1 Corinthians 2 teaches that you've got to have the Spirit of God in you uh, to know the things of God. And so when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, that's the gospel by which we're saved according to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4. When you believe He died for your sins on the cross, was buried and rose again, you trust in Him and what He did for you. You come to Him as a lost sinner not offering him anything. You don't have anything he wants. You don't have anything to offer him. The Bible said there's none righteous, no, not one. When you trust Christ as your Savior, he gives you his righteousness. You're saved by grace through faith. The Spirit of God uh, dwells in you, and he will teach you the word as you believe the book. That's the second main key. You've got to be a Bible believer. Uh, because if you don't humble yourself and submit to the final authority of God's word, believing his word, uh, you're going to hinder uh, the, spirit, the spirit of God from showing you what he wants to show you in the word of God. Uh, You've got to submit to the Bible and quit going to the Bible to try and, try and find verses to support what you already think. You need to go to the Bible to find out what you ought to think. Uh, and, and go with a blank slate, so to speak, and say, all right, what does the Bible say? And I'll believe what it says. And quit reading preconceived ideas into it, but just take it for what it says and be a Bible believer. In the English language, we, language, we have a perfect book, the inspired Word of God in the King James Bible. And we taught a number of lessons on that. You've got to have confidence you have the pure Word of God if you're going to be a Bible student. Now, we've been dealing with the issue of rightly dividing the word of truth. That is the major key to Bible study because you can be saved and believe the Bible, but if you don't rightly divide it, you're not going to get very far when it comes to understanding the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our motive needs to be a heart that's right with God. We want to uh, be approved unto Him. Uh, it's, it's about our relationship with Him, and we want to study the Bible the way He tells us. And He told you, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is to acknowledge the, the divisions that He put in His Word. Don't make up your own divisions, and don't ignore the divisions that are there, rightly dividing the word of truth. We've talked about a number of things along these lines. We talked about what the main division in the Bible is, and we talked about uh, the dispensational layout of the books of the Bible. We showed you how Paul rightly divided the Bible according to Ephesians 2. And uh, we've looked at a number of things concerning Israel, concerning the body of Christ. And uh, here recently, we've been dealing with some specific things. We, we started off very general and foundational. And there is an order to our lessons. They are building as we go. And uh, that way... We, we, you know, we archive our lessons on YouTube so that if you miss any of them, you can check those out. I encourage you to follow along in the series in the order that we're going. Uh, and uh, so we're dealing with things more particular now. In our last study, we talked about different churches revealed in the Bible. A church is simply a called out assembly. You got to look at the context to see which church is being referred to. If you think there's only one church in the whole Bible, 
you're going to be greatly hindered in understanding the Word of God. Uh, there, there, there was a church in the Old Testament, according to Acts 7, verse 38, Israel called out of Egypt, assembled in the wilderness. Uh, there are going to be churches on the earth after the rapture of the body of Christ. There will be assemblies of believers in the tribulation period. That's not us. There is a church which is the body of Christ. That's what God is building in this present age. All believers are baptized by one spirit and one body upon salvation. There, that's a very distinct thing. And there are different churches, and we talked about some of those things. And, of course, we ran out of time before we could get as far as we wanted to, but we tried to just show you some basic things about that. I tell you, if you think that um, when you see word uh, like gospel, we've talked about different gospels in the Bible. If every time you see the word gospel you think it's the same thing, you're going to be greatly hindered in understanding the Word of God. Same thing with church. Now, also with baptism, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, when I say the word baptism, most people immediately think of water baptism. But there are actually a number of baptisms in the Bible that do not involve water at all. And if you think that every time you see the word baptism in the Bible that it's referring to water baptism, uh, you're going to fall into some serious error. You know, that's what happened, for an example, with Alexander Campbell. He, uh, he, is, he was the leader of the Campbellites. They like to call themselves the Church of Christ today and pretend that they're the only true church. But uh, Alexander Campbell uh, started that sect, that heretical sect that teaches baptismal regeneration. And old Alexander Campbell said, uh, well, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4 says we're baptized into Christ. And he thought that was water baptism. But it's not. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But you'll fall into some serious error if you don't understand the different baptisms in the Bible. That's why we're talking about this subject. And uh, I tell you, I know it's a controversial subject. You don't have to tell me that. I, I'm well aware. And the fact is, is that the professing church has been divided over baptism. And um, a lot of different ideas out there, very controversial. Somebody said it's like religious TNT. I mean, if you want to start a fight among professing Christians, bring up baptism and get different groups saying different things about it. Next thing you know, you're going to have a royal rumble when it comes to the thing. But he, look, uh, they say, well, is baptism by immersion or is it sprinkling or pouring? They say, well, is it for salvation or church membership uh, or testimony? Uh, who has the authority to baptize? Some people say you got to be baptized by a man who was baptized by a man who was baptized by a man who was all the way back to John the Baptist. And that's ridiculous, of course. Um, they say, well, what, what words are to be said? Some say you got to say, I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some say, no, you just say in the name of Christ. And, and you got controversy about even the, the words that are said when they're being baptized. Another legitimate question that you won't hear asked very much, but it's legitimate, is this. Does it even matter today? Is water baptism really that big of a deal today in this age of grace? Um, you know, we need, to, we need to really look at the Word of God on this and come to some understanding. Uh, some, some say water baptism is required for salvation. Others say, it's, well, it's not for salvation, but you can't be a member of the church without it. And You know, that's, all that's absolutely wrong. Just totally wrong. And we're going to show you that today in this study. First of all, what is baptism? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, many will say, well, the, you know, if you look up the word baptism in a dictionary, a religious dictionary, it'll say to immerse or to dip in water. Well, that, that might be the definition that men give it, but that's not the definition the Bible gives it. You can't find that definition in the Bible. Uh, did you know that the nation of Israel was baptized in the Old Testament and they didn't get wet at all? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's the first baptism that's called the baptism, actually, uh, in history, according to the Scripture. And you don't find out about it till 1 Corinthians 10, but it happened in the book of Exodus. 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were, pass, uh, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized on the Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now you have the historical record of that in Exodus, but you don't realize until you come to this passage it's called a baptism, and that's a very helpful thing. And by the way, that shows you you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. 
That's, that's a very crucial thing in understanding the Scripture. Uh, other passages will shed light on the passage you're studying. This is called a baptism. They were baptized unto Moses. They walked across on dry ground. So if this is the first baptism and uh, they walked across on dry ground, then baptism is not immersion in water. In fact, the ones that got immersed in water were the Egyptian army, and they all drowned and went to hell. So that's, uh, that won't work. You can't say, you can't say that uh, baptism is, is immersion in water. Now, now I, I didn't say that there's no water baptism. Obviously, there is water baptism in the Scripture. But uh, that's not what it essentially is. Uh, this passage helps us understand that baptism essentially is an identification. Israel following Moses' leadership. Moses was the God-appointed leader and spokesman, and he stepped out by faith into that uh, sea, and it parted, and he led the children of Israel across on dry ground. They were identified with Moses being the leader, and there's a prophetic significance to all of that and typology and so forth. We don't have time to study that. I'm just pointing out the fact that they were baptized on the Moses, and they certainly were not immersed in water. Let's go to uh, the first passage in the Bible in which baptism is mentioned. That's Matthew 3. We can learn a lot about baptism in Matthew chapter 3. The book of Matthew again and again talks about the kingdom of heaven. And that's not talking about dying and going to heaven. That's talking about the God of heaven putting his kingdom on the earth. Jesus taught his disciples to pray Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the, the gospel of the kingdom was the good news that the promised kingdom that God promised Israel was at hand and uh, that's going to be established on the earth. And uh, Matthew does not reveal anything about the body of Christ in this age. That was revealed later through Paul. So here in Matthew chapter 3, and understand that Jesus conducted his entire earthly ministry under the law. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And you find him teaching in accordance with the law all through his ministry. There couldn't have even been a New Testament until the cross because Hebrews 9 teaches that you can't have a testament without the death of the testator. And so we're on Old Testament ground then, basically, here in Matthew 3. Let's look at it. Verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye. Well, who's the ye? Well, that'd be Israel. That's who he's preaching to. He wasn't preaching to Gentiles. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make its paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. And locust was a clean thing to eat according to the Levitical uh, dietary law. So John wasn't a crazy man. I mean, this was a legitimate meal. And he was out in the wilderness, and he was a great prophet, a forerunner of this king, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, what? Confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid of the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So the gospel of the kingdom required water baptism. It was a baptism of repentance. The Jews were in a covenant relationship with God, and they were in a wrong standing. They were not right with God in accordance with that covenant. And they had to partake of this ceremonial washing uh, in regard to that, and they had to be confessing their sins, repenting, and they had to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, Okay, so this, is, this has got to do with Israel. There's no doubt about that. And uh, notice some things about this before we read on. I'm going to read on further, but notice some things about this in general. So the forerunner of the king here, John, he's baptizing repentant Jews for the remission of sins. And uh, Mark chapter 1, it said very plainly that this was a baptism for the remission of sins. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. He said the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the water washed away their sins, but what it means is they had to be baptized to prove their faith in that message. And in Acts chapter 3, we find that Israel as a nation will have their sins blotted out at the second coming of Christ. So this water baptism was looking ahead to that. It, it identified them with their Messiah and His kingdom, and it was required. That's why in Mark 16, Jesus commissioned the twelve to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It was necessary. He went on to say the signs would follow them also, and that's signs of the kingdom. That's why in Acts 2, 38, Peter preaching to Israel said, Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, a lot of people today that understand baptism is not necessary for salvation, uh, they, what they do to get around the passage because they won't rightly divide it is they try to go to the Greek and change it. But it says what it says. It was necessary. But that's the gospel of the kingdom. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Obviously, then Paul's gospel did not uh, contain water baptism as part of it, but the gospel of the kingdom did. This baptism was to manifest Christ to Israel. John the Baptist said in John 1, verse 31, to manifest Christ to Israel, therefore I come baptizing with water. And uh, it was a ceremonial washing. It was a ceremonial purification. How do I know that? Because that's what the Bible says. For an example, in John chapter 3, you'll find in verses 23 through 26 in there that there arose a question about purifying, and it was having to do with baptism. And then Ananias, who was a devout man according to the law, he told Saul of Tarsus, according to Acts 22, six, uh, verse 12 through 16, when Paul was recounting his conversion, he talked about how Ananias, who was devout according to the law, said uh, to him to arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, Ananias didn't know what the Lord had revealed to Paul when he saved him, and he didn't understand what God was going to do with Paul at that point. He was a devout man according to the law. The point is this. It was a washing. It was a ceremonial purification. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that God's purpose for Israel is that they be a kingdom of priests in the earth. And if you go back in the law, you'll find that in order to be inducted into the priesthood and to the priestly office, the priest had to be washed with water. John the Baptist, his father was a priest, Zacharias. And so you have this issue here in regard to Israel. It's got nothing to do with us today. Look, please, in Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Verse 11 here has three baptisms in one verse. Baptism with water, baptism with the Holy Ghost, and baptism with fire. Now, some people, they want this fire baptism. They think it's got to do with power and signs and wonders. The fire baptism is judgment. Verse 12 makes that clear. No, you don't want that fire baptism. Now, the, the baptism with the Holy Ghost was promised and prophesied in Isaiah and Joel and Ezekiel and other passages. And what it was is the promise that the Spirit of God would be poured out on them and they would have the power to do the signs and wonders of the kingdom. That's not something that takes place today. That was a prophesied baptism with the Holy Ghost in regard to Israel's kingdom. People talk about the baptism of the, of the Holy Ghost. The Bible never says that. There, there was a baptism with the Holy Ghost. Christ from heaven pouring out the Spirit for power on His apostles. But there is a baptism by the Spirit into Christ upon salvation, and that's, that's what was revealed to Paul for this age, and that's a different thing. Now, so there was three baptisms in one verse. Not only that, look at another thing here in Matthew 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it uh, to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. 
dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now people talk about following the Lord in baptism. They say, Well, I'm going to be baptized because Jesus was. And I hey, look, I'm not trying to be, you know, harsh, but that's just simply not the case. You, you can't follow this because this was a unique baptism. Jesus, uh, John didn't want to baptize him. He said, I, I got to be baptized of you. How am I going to? How am I going to baptize you? Because it was a baptism of repentance, and Jesus Christ needed no repentance. He's the sinless Son of God. So John didn't understand what this was all about, but Jesus said it fulfilled all righteousness. Well, this was something unique that he did as the Son of God. And he was identifying himself with his people. And also, again, he's going to be the great high priest. And once again, when the priest entered into the, his office, he was washed. And also he was anointed with oil. Well, here you see Jesus being washed and then the Holy Ghost anointing him for his ministry. This is a unique thing. The baptism of Christ is something that nobody can follow. It was unique to the Son of God. Then Christ spoke of a baptism he had to be baptized with after he was baptized with water. That's in Luke 12, verse 50. After he was baptized with water, he had a baptism to be baptized with, and he was referring to his suffering on the cross. He told the disciples they would be baptized with suffering in Matthew 20, verse 20 through 23. Then we come to Paul's ministry. There is the mystery of the church, which is the body of Christ revealed to Paul, and the spiritual baptism that makes us members of one body, that's only found in his epistles. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit we all baptize in one body. That's not the baptism with the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was Christ pouring out the Spirit on the disciples in accordance with prophecy for power to do the signs of the kingdom. The baptism by one spirit was the Spirit baptizing believers into Christ upon salvation and it was a mystery. That's a different thing. So let's review the baptisms we've considered so far. We have seven. Number one, baptism under Moses. Number two, baptism under repentance. That was a water baptism. Number three, the baptism of Christ. It was a unique thing. Number four, the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Number five, the baptism with fire. Number six, the baptism of suffering. And then number seven, the baptism into the body of Christ. Seven distinct baptisms. Identification, if that's the definition, and I believe it is, that'll work with all of those. That the, all those baptisms had to do with now identification. Now look please in Ephesians 4 with the time we have left. Ephesians chapter 4. So we've noticed seven baptisms. And uh, some people think there's more than that. But that there's at least those. In Ephesians 4, notice in verse number 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. That's the unity of the Spirit, according to verse 3. The unity of the Spirit. These are spiritual things. And there's only one of each. And this is the basis of our fellowship as the body of Christ. One body. Now, there are many local churches, but there's one body of Christ. You can be a part of a local church and not even be saved, but you're not in the body of Christ unless you're saved. God is building one body of Christ. You never find one time in the Bible where it mentions bodies of Christ. There's one body. Paul said uh, that we are members of one body in Romans 12, and he said that to believers at Rome, and Paul at that point had never been to Rome, but he was in the same body with them. All right, one body. And one spirit that puts you in that one body, how? By one baptism. Now, seven baptisms we looked at, which one is the baptism Paul referred to when he said there's one baptism? It can't be water baptism. How do I know? Because water baptism can't put you in the body of Christ. That's ridiculous. And people say, well, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 means that the Spirit led us to be water baptized into the, church, the local church, which is the body of Christ. Now, folks, that is just nonsense. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. You, look, 
being in Christ is a spiritual position. The Spirit of God puts you in Christ. He identifies you with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. When He died, you died. When He was buried, you were buried. When He's risen, you're risen. He's ascended up and seated at the right hand of the Father, and you're seated with Him in heavenly places. He that has joined the Lord is one spirit. That is a spiritual reality. And some people mock that and say, well, uh, that's some kind of spooky doctrine. Look, folks, I mean, the, the fact is there are a lot of things that are real that are invisible. The Holy Spirit's invisible. Are you going to tell me He doesn't exist because you can't see Him? No, there is, a, there is a spiritual church. There is a spiritual baptism. The Bible reveals that. And uh, it is very real, but it's spiritual. Water cannot put you in Christ. Paul mentioned water baptism one time. Look in 1 Corinthians 1. He mentioned water baptism one time in his epistles. Just once. And the other times when he talks about baptism, as in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, being baptized into Christ, into his death, and so on. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Galatians 3, 27 and 28, Colossians 2, verse 10 to 12. That's all talking about spiritual baptism. Buried with him in baptism is not saying being put under the water. It's saying you, when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. You're buried with him spiritually. You're identified with him, see. And uh, you know, John was baptizing with water, never said in water. It said with water. And he wasn't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So people say, well, you've got to be baptized by immersion to picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's not what the Bible says. You're identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ by the Spirit of God when you get saved. That's what matters. All right, so there's only one spiritual baptism that matters today. And yet people will fight and fuss and divide over a water ceremony that Paul never one time told us we had to even uh, participate in. He never one time required it. The only time he brought it up, he said this, to a divided church, a carnal church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said in verse number 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, in the same epistle, twice, in chapter 4 and chapter 11, he goes on to tell them to follow him in the spiritual sense of following the truth Christ revealed through him to them. But he rebukes them over being divided over personality, being divided over uh, men as leaders, and uh, even bringing Christ down on the same level uh, with Paul or Apollos when Christ is the head of the body. And he, they're carnal. He's rebuking them. They're divided. He said, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, obviously not. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say, I baptize in my own name. And so... He's saying, look, the way y'all are acting, if I would have baptized more of you, I might be claiming I did it in my name. He said, not at all. And then he said, I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. He only baptized a few, couldn't even remember for sure who it was. How could he make such a statement? For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The one time Paul brought up baptism, he acknowledged that in the Acts period, he did baptize a few of them. He never required it. He never commanded it. He said he was sent not to do it. So the only baptism that matters today is being baptized by one spirit and one body when you get saved. I appreciate you joining us. I hope you'll join us again next time.